I was growing up, my, I was in a music family. Uh, my grandfather, who, grandma, my grandfather and grandma, they adopted me. Uh, that was my mother's uh, folks. Um, and my grandfather was already in music. He was in and out of bands. His name was Shorty, Shorty Medlock. And he was in and out of bands all throughout, you know, bands out of Nashville and all throughout the Southeast. In fact, he played on a TV show um, from 53 through 58 called The Toby Downey Show. And I learned how to play uh, banjo at the age of three. And I played a miniature five-string banjo on the television show with him uh, for that five-year span. In the midst of that, I started uh, playing guitar. I uh, started playing guitar when I was five and picked up his old acoustic guitar. And, uh, he showed me three chords. He showed me G, C, and D. And he says, now you're on your own. Go learn the rest of it on your own. You know. And I always played everything by ear uh, anyway. Um, then I learned how I picked up playing drums when I was about eight and uh, played in his bands, uh, played drums in his bands when I was real, you know, real young. And just kind of came up through the ranks of, of um, you know, came up through the ranks like that of playing music. I mean, it was pretty well, it was pretty well uh, knowledgeable of probably what I was going to do in my life. In 1955, my parents bought me my first transistor radio, which was pretty well about like that by that. Ran on a nine, oh, one of them old style nine volt batteries, the big ones, you know. And we used to listen to a radio station in Jacksonville, Florida called WAPE. And it was an AM station at first. Later on, switched over to an FM station. And um, used to listen to all the old rock stars. But of course, Elvis was big at that time. And I remember my parents, Elvis was coming to town, to Jacksonville. And if you go into the history books about Elvis, you can see his tour dates. You can see Jacksonville, Florida at the Florida Theater. I went to see him. My parents took me to see Elvis in, right before my seventh birthday in Jacksonville uh, at the Florida Theater. And my, my mom and dad, they used to love to tell this story because on our way home, uh, my dad looked at me and says, well, what did you think of that, son? And I said to both of them, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to do that, you know. And pretty well, all throughout my life, I held that in my head that, uh, that it was all going to work out real well for me, uh, being in music. Um, I never really got into the whole music thing because, you know, I, I knew that that was the way to fame and fortune. I got into uh, playing the music. I got into playing music because of the art, of the, of, the, of the point of playing music. And I love the creation of it. I love the, I love the fact that you sit down with six strings on a guitar and you only got seven chords, you know, A through, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you write songs out of six strings and seven chords. I believe today it's 2013 and I believe that every song that could possibly be written has been written. I don't think that you can pick um, a, you know, a set of chords uh, to play that hasn't already had a song written to them. My beginnings like that, you know, I, I came up through the ranks like that playing in bands, uh, 13, 14 years old in bands. Just worked my way up as, you know, rehearsing with bands and playing in different bands. And finally, um, I went to Woodstock, uh, you know, when I was 19 years old. And I already uh, was playing in a band and me and my, two of my bandmates, Hal and Russell, we got in a 1963 Econoline van had three in the tree, they called it, three speed and with a reverse. Drove to Woodstock, was there the whole time. Saw the most unbelievable bands. I mean, they, you know, we knew Hendrix was gonna be there, The Who was gonna be there, all these great bands, you know? And 
we actually witnessed some pretty magical nights there, you know. Um, got back. We continued our bands. Blackfoot got together shortly after that. Uh, we left Florida, moved up to New York, to the New York, New Jersey area. Um, stayed up here. I got kind of discouraged with it. And that's when, uh, late 70, early 71, I made the call to Jacksonville and spoke to Ronnie Van Zandt um, and said uh, to him, um, I'm pretty discouraged with what I'm doing right now. I would like uh, to know um, <coughs> if you need a roadie, uh, somebody drive a truck or set up equipment or whatever, you know. And he said to me at the time, do you still play drums? And I said, yes, I do. And uh, he said, well, our drummer, Bob, Bob Burns, is leaving us. And we're supposed to be in Muscle Shoals in a couple of weeks cutting our first record. And I said, I'm in. I brushed up on licks and stuff, you know, at, a, at the band house to where we were all at. And off I went. They sent me an airplane ticket. I sold off some equipment of mine. Had some cash in my pocket. Took what guitars I had left over. <coughs> and off I went. Um, got into Jacksonville. Went to my mom and dad's house. Dropped my stuff off. And I was rehearsing. Went to the rehearsal room with Ronnie, Gary, Allen. And at the time, Larry Junstrom, who is now the bass player for 38 Special, who went on to play with them. And they're all their eight, eight years. And that's the original Leonard Skinner, was Ronnie, Gary, Allen, me, and Larry Junstrom. So it started from there. We went to Muscle Shoals, cut all that great material that came out later on after the disaster happened. Came out in 78 called the Muscle Shoals Sessions. And you know what? I, I look back on it, and here I am again. Then I. After I left Skinner in right before their first record came out, I went back with Blackfoot uh, in late 73, early 74. Got those guys back together. Um, we toughed it out. We came back up to New Jersey. Got our record deal uh, up here. Finally hit a good record deal with Atlantic Records, ATCO and put the Strikes album out in 78, 79, had our first hit record, the rest was history. And we rode that <coughs> for, excuse me, we rode that for, oh God, what, till 85? Then we broke up due to different things, you know, the business always takes its toll on different bands for odd reasons, different reasons. And then I kept the band going. I owned the name. I bought the name outright from the guys. Um, I bought the name, and the next thing you know, um, I got a call from uh, the widow of Ronnie Van Zandt inviting me in 1995, after Christmas of 95, inviting me to Atlanta for Freebird the movie premiere. And I went to it. And I seen Gary and Leon and Billy and Johnny and all of them. I went out and jammed with them. Their manager told my manager, you know, Gary's been talking about putting Ricky back in the band for several years. <clears throat> they saw me play. They saw how the audience reacted to it. And about three months later, in March of 96, I got a call from Gary Rossington. And Gary said, I've still got the tape from the tape machine. And Gary said, hey, Ricky, this is Gary. Um, I want um, I want you to learn I Ain't the One, uh, Saturday Night Special, That Smell, and Freebird. And I want to come down to Florida. I'm going to audition you. And if you pass the audition, I'll give you $1.50 in a Snickers bar and put you back in the band. So uh, I must have passed the audition because I've been here now going on 18 years. And um, it's been great. Um, I can't see any other way. Uh, maybe other than just side projects that I might have going on or whatever, but this will be my, this will be the way I'll finish out my career. You know, I love it. 60s music, 
I think was it was so virgin back then. I mean, there was a lot of great musicians writing a lot of great songs. Uh, and it was forming a certain rock era. I mean, the 60s all of a sudden had the Beatles. And then the next thing you know, it had, it had you know, they had the Stones. Then the next thing you know, it had Hendrix. Or Hendrix and the Stones, and then it had Zeppelin. Then it had Deep Purple. Then it had all these bands that all of a sudden took themselves right in to the 70s. We lost Hendrix, which was a shame. Cream broke up. Uh, Led Zeppelin continued. The Beatles broke up. You know, I mean, it was a... All of a sudden, it kind of transformed itself. I thought that the 60s probably was one of the best magical eras of music. I think that when the 70s came in, everybody kind of started, uh, you know, the, the English bands, kind of a lot of them went, kind of went their way, and Clapton did his own thing with Derek and the Dominoes, and then went on his own, and you know, so forth and so on. Next thing you know, you've got, you know, next thing you know, you've got the Allman Brothers, you know. Then all of a sudden, you know, the Southern thing started. And everybody was like, what's going on down South? Well, the South, you know, that's where the blues came from, you know. And there was an old saying called the blues had a baby and they called it rock and roll. And the next thing you know, you've got all these bands that are forming. And then along comes this band who used to be called the 1%, now they're called Leonard Skinner, and they have a record come out, and next thing you know, kaboom, Freebird is born. And, then, and all of a sudden, here you got these guys with a singer who to me was probably way ahead of his time. Uh, he was a genius. He could relate. He wrote lyrics that people could really get next to and reflect on. And the next thing you know, four great years, and then it came to a halt. Boom, you know? And it was, and it all of a sudden it was like something was just like the rug taken out of everybody's feet. And I remember record companies were scrambling to find another Leonard Skinner. And thus, you know, you had a lot of Southern bands came out down there. Molly Hatchet came out of that. Blackfoot came out of it. But man, we had record company people all over the South looking for bands. Um, the 70s music to me was, I think, a regeneration period. Regenerating what the 60s had brought in, dumped off. It was regenerating itself. Then the next thing you know, we've got the 80s, the hair band era. And the southern rock bands were out. The hair bands are in. And we got flooded by all this, like, uh, formulated music that was just everybody had a formula and radio stations love the formula and so therefore you've got you know you've got I think that out of all of I like to think to me personally and this is not knocking anybody but my god at the end of the 70s you had Van Halen come out and Eddie Van Halen he reinvented the guitar he reinvented the electric guitar, just like Hendrix had reinvented it. Next thing you know, you had Hendrix, Clapton, and Jimmy Page, and Jeff Beck. And all of a sudden, then you had Eddie Van Halen down here reinvented the guitar. And everybody wanted to be like Eddie Van Halen. Every time I turned around, a guitar player was doing the hammer-ons and all that stuff, you know, trying to play like Eddie. There was only one Eddie, you know? And... All of a sudden, you got all these bands, and I'd like to think that Van Halen really, between Van Halen and probably Motley Crue and people like that were the originators. You know, they were the guys that came before, and everybody else sort of fell in line and came along afterwards. Um, then you got into the 90s. You got into the 90s, and then the next thing you know, the hair bands are out and the grunge bands are in. On www.rockscene.com, it'll tell you all the latest and especially what's going on with Leonard Skinner.